So I'm going to be doing some hardware volt mods on this GTX 280 video card um, in preparation for some overclocking on dry ice this weekend. And I thought it might be a good opportunity to make an instructional video basically explaining um, the basics of hardware volt mods and why they work. And how they work, um, there are already some instructionals on basic volt modding that are available, um, especially the most famous one um, often referenced on overclock.net which um, basically gives a good instructional um, on how to do volt mods and actually I'll link it um, in the description just because it is a good resource and it might help to read through that as well but that one is kind of a pretty basic like step-by-step -step guide it doesn't explain quite as much of the theory behind why volt mods actually work and so I thought that it would be good to make a video that basically kind of adds on to what's already in there, um, explains a little bit of how a VRM works on a super basic level, not going to get into it that much, but just what a VRM is, what a voltage controller is, um, and why voltage mods work, and in what circumstances the basic voltage mod uh, setup may not work, because there are some video cards where you can't do the basic um, configuration because of the way the voltage controller is configured. So anyways, I thought this video would kind of be a supplement to what's already out there and maybe someone will find it helpful um, for a quick introduction to volt mods. So why would you want to do a hardware volt mod? There are a few reasons um, you'd want a volt mod in hardware. First of all, a lot of modern video cards don't really give you very much control over the core voltage, which is of course the main most important voltage for overclocking. So if you have a modern video card, like for example a Pascal video card, um, and you want to get it to high volts, it's really you kind of your only option is to do a hardware volt mod in many cases, unless you have a card that has um, a digital controller that can be co controlled through like uh, an EV2C or something. But that's a whole other story. And if you know what that is, you probably don't need to watch this video. But anyways, um, yeah, so increase the core voltage for better overclocking, especially if you have good cooling is one reason you'd want to do a volt mod, especially if your video card doesn't allow you to do that in the software, and the new ones basically they almost never do. Um, another reason is because um, some, some voltage rails you don't have control over in software really at all usually. Um, usually these are like minor rails, like for example memory, even on a lot of old cards you don't get mem control over memory voltage in software easily. Um, and then like auxiliary rails like PLL, um, 0.95 volt display drive rails, these are rails that aren't that important if you're overclocking on water usually unless you like are really gunning for high scores on hardware bot or something, but they can be very helpful if you're going um, to sub-zero because sometimes tweaking those voltages around can help the GPU perform better or, or boot at all if you're on dry ice or liquid nitrogen cooling. Um, but yeah, you can also just tweak those voltages and maybe it helps um, even on ambient, on air or water cooling. You might get a little bit of extra voltage, especially for memory. Sometimes you can get a little bit more scaling out of the memory from increasing the voltage. So anyways, um, there are a number of reasons you might want to do hardware volt mods um, to get increased performance out of your video card. And this uh, video will provide a, kind of a basic guide of how those work. So anyways, before we get into into um, modding this video card, let's take a look at some basic theory um, and I'm going to go onto my computer and do some OBS just to kind of show some pictures and explain on a super basic level how a VRM works and um, how the voltage mod actually works. All right, so let's do a bit of VRM theory, um, how a VRM works on a basic level, which is something you kind of have to understand if you're going to do volt mods and really like get what's going on. Um, you kind of have to understand the basics of what a VRM is and what the components are, etc. Um, Wikichip has this great article on VRMs, which I'm going to be using for the diagrams and kind of just like, you know, mousing over them and giving a basic just a bit, Bill Zoid, who does a lot of overclocking focused um, PC hardware content, also has a good video on how VRMs work, which I definitely will link in the description as well, because you should check it out. Um, anyways, let's get into it, and apologies if I make any, you know, it's going to be a lot of oversimplification, maybe some imprecise language. If you're an engineer, you might be cringing, but, you know, I'm just trying to give the basic gist of how a VRM works at a level that you, you know, would be appropriate for someone who's mostly just interested in modding. But anyways, okay, let's get into it. So your, your computer's power supply 
Um, you, if you ever built a computer, you've bought a power supply. Um, you know, it's the like box with a fan in it and it has a bunch of wires coming out. Um, the power supply basically takes whatever your outlet voltage is in the US would be 120 volts AC and turns it into a bunch of voltages, but the pertinent one here is 12 volts DC. That's the one that gets fed to your motherboard and to your GPU um, is 12 volts. And you might think, okay, that 12 volts probably just goes right into all the stuff, right? No, that's actually not really how it works. The 12 volts gets plugged into your GPU, but the GPU core or the actual, you know, the actual integrated circuit um, that powers all the calculations on your GPU, it does not want 12 volts. 12 volts is way too high for a modern integrated circuit in most cases. Um, nothing is going to want 12 volts. It's going to want like basically 1 volt to 1.4 volts for, um, you know, for the core. And then your memory will sometimes get up to like 2 volts. Um, even on modern memory, on old memory, you can sometimes get up to like 5. But anyways, the point is that the actual things that do the calculations and the storage, et cetera, the actual integrated circuits on your GPU and your CPU, they don't want this 12 volts. They need it in a lower voltage. So basically the job of the VRM is to take that 12 volts from your power supply and turn it into the voltage that the different things on your video card actually need to operate. Um, so how does it do this? Well, there's basically only one way that a modern um, voltage controller for like a gaming type PC works and it's a buck converter. Um, so the way that basically operates is you have an inductor and the inductor is really the key piece to kind of understanding the theory of why how a VRM is able to turn 12 volts into a lower voltage. So this is a diagram basically showing what the VRM looks like um, when you're powering up the inductor. So what does the inductor do here? First of all, the inductor prevents that the inductor basically stores energy. It's kind of like an energy Well, yeah an energy store, but not in like a battery sense more in like a short-term sense on the order of like a fractions of a second But what you do with the inductor is basically give it short bursts of 12 volts so you can see you can see right here, this graph shows what would happen if you just charge the inductor all the way to 12 and then let it drain. So when the inductor, when you apply power to the inductor, it slowly builds up a charge and it allows more and more voltage through. When you remove the 12 volts applied to the inductor, the, it's built up a magnetic field. This is basically charging a magnetic field when this graph is climbing of the output voltage over time. And then when you stop applying 12 volts to the inductor, that magnetic field that you've built up gradually dissipates. And so you'll go back down from the high voltage to, to, um, you know, to zero volts again, once the charge is gone. Now, if you look at this graph, you can kind of already begin to understand how a VRM works. You can think, what if you only applied power until this got to like two volts right here? or whatever voltage you need. What if you only applied power until here and then you remove the power and then it went down? And then you could apply it again and build it back up and then it would go down and then build it back up and it would go down. You can kind of see how you could maintain roughly the voltage you want by just doing short bursts of 12 volts to the inductor. And that's basically exactly what, how a buck converter operates. Um, instead of, you know, charging the inductor all the way up and draining it all the way, you charge it in short little bursts and, and let it drain roughly around the voltage that you want. So you can see a diagram of that right here. Basically, so these, these peaks represent, these, um, this green thing represents what's called a PWM signal. So basically, um, you're telling this switch to close and open based on this signal. Um, and that controls whether the 12 volts is applied to the inductor. So when the VRM first turns on for a very brief time, it'll charge the inductor up to whatever, you know, whatever charge corresponds to the output voltage that you want. Then over time, it's going to give away that energy. So you're going to get a slight drop in the voltage. And then once it gets too low, you just give it another burst of 12 volts, another verse, burst of that control PWM signal that controls um, when, the, when the switch is on and off you give it another little burst and then it gets some more energy and then it slowly gives that energy away. You give it another burst, etc. And so in that way you can roughly achieve, you know, this voltage right here 
by just cycling the power to the inductor in short little bursts like this. And if you have something that's really power hungry and you need a much tighter regulation of your voltage, you can combine multiple of these buck converters, this basic circuit. You can combine a bunch of these, but have them slightly offset from each other. So have these signals be slightly different. So what you get there is a multi-phase system, which you can see in this diagram. And you're basically, your output looks something like this. So you can see, instead of getting, like if you look at just one phase, your voltage would be this orange right here. And you can see it goes up and then it goes all the way down, etc. Well, with a multi-phase system, what you get is you sum all these different phases and the resulting power has much less swing in voltage uh, or ripple as it were than a single phase and also there's benefits for you know balancing the current etc we won't get into anyways that's the basic theory of how a vrm works you're controlling the electricity flow into an inductor in a way that gives you the output voltage you want highly oversimplified there's flyback diodes there's capacitors um and etc there's a low side mosfet that closes to allow the current to go through the whole circuit when the switch to the 12 volts is open um, of course. But anyways, so, so that's how the v VRM works on a basic level. The chip that controls the chip that controls the, um, the sending of the 12 volts to each um, phase that controls the flow of the power to the inductors in a way that maintains the voltage you want is called the voltage controller. And the voltage controller is the most important component for volt modding because the way that we're going to get a voltage that's higher than the voltage that you're supposed to have is by tricking the voltage controller into thinking that it needs to output the higher voltage. Because the voltage controller, you know, the voltage controller decides how much 12 volts gets sent to um, all the inductors, how much PWM signal you're going to give them. And so by tricking the voltage controller into thinking that it's doing less voltage than it is, what you basically have is you will cause the voltage controller to increase the PWM duty cycle to output more of those 12 volt um, signals to, to feed the 12 volts. And as a result, you will get a higher output voltage from your VRM. Um, and so the voltage controller is always or almost always going to have a, a sense pin, which basically connects to the output. So it connects to, you know, where the power goes to the to the core so it connects to like right here um right before the power goes into the core and it reads the voltage it's basically seeing how much how much voltage is our but is our you know is our vrm outputting and does it need to be higher or lower can i adjust it up or down etc um so yeah so this voltage sense reads the output voltage and by changing the voltage that this thing sees you can you can make it think it's outputting less than it is and it'll rise the voltage to compensate and you'll have a higher voltage so um next the next thing we're going to discuss is a voltage divider because luckily for us volt modders usually the implementation of this sense involves a voltage divider and that makes it very easy to change the voltage that the voltage controller sees and so um yeah, so that's going to be the next thing we discuss, and I'll just tab over to that now. And so before we move on to actually modifying the card and showing how this stuff works in practice, there are two things that we can kind of extrapolate from this. First of all, it should be obvious that if you don't have a voltage divider implementation, this isn't going to work. So let's say, let's say that the designer of your GPU, for whatever reason, implemented the voltage controller without a voltage divider, and there is no R1 here. Well, then obviously modifying this resistance between the feedback pin and the ground isn't really going to do anything. In that case, where the volt source voltage is being read directly by the voltage controller with no divider, you might need to think of a different scheme such as implementing your own voltage divider and creating one from scratch and just adding a few resistors such that you can, um, you know, divide the voltage as much as you need it, need to do it. Um, and then there... Um, Another like thing we can infer from the way this works is that 
it's dangerous to, to have your parallel resistor be too low in resistance. So let's say, um, for whatever reason, we measured one of these wrong or something, and we accidentally used a parallel resistor that was like five ohms. We added a five ohm resistor in parallel with a 1.8. Our, our combined resistance there would be 1.32. So what happens if we add 1.32 here? Well, we have 1.4 volts. That's not, that's not terrible, but it's pretty high, and we wouldn't be able to get any lower with the voltage mod turned on. Now let's say we accidentally did one volt or something. A one ohm, rather. Well, our equivalent resistance would be 0.64. We put that in here, and then we'd get 2.2 volts. That's 2.2 volts is going to kill your GPU core pretty quickly, if not instantly. Um, unless you're on liquid nitrogen, maybe. So the, I guess the lesson there is that making this parallel resistor too high, like let's say you made it, you know, 10,000. Well, then your resistance, your output resistance is basically the same as it is without this resistor. And so what happens is basically nothing happens. Your voltage mod just isn't going to do anything. So with the resistor being too large, worst case scenario here is that you just, your voltage mod just doesn't do anything at all. It doesn't work. With, this res with the parallel resistor being too low, the worst case scenario is you blow up your GPU. So that's why if you're not really sure what's happening or if it's your first time or whatever, um, it might be best to start with a relatively high uh, parallel resistor. And oftentimes a rule of thumb that's given for volt mods is m just measure R2. You don't even need to worry about R1. As long as you have a voltage divider, and even if you don't, you're probably not going to blow anything up by adding a parallel resistor. So just add a parallel resistor here, a potentiometer, that where the value is 20 times R2. And so we can see if we did that in this case, um, our R2 was 1.8. Let's just say it's 2 for simplicity, about 2. So 20 times 2 is 40. So if we had a 40 ohm resistor here, yeah, it would have given us about 1.72. It's about right. Um, and that would have been, you know, it would have given us about 1.22. So that's why the rule of thumb is often said to be just measure R2 and do 20 times that. It usually gives you about what you want. But sometimes with the 20 times rule, in my experience, sometimes it gives you a voltage that's a bit high. So if you're going to use the 20 times rule when you choose the value for your parallel resistor here or your potentiometer, um, I think the 20 times rule is decent, but if you're using the 20 times rule, I would recommend keeping an eye on the voltage. Don't just do the 20 times rule and assume it's okay. If you're doing the 20 times rule, you're going to turn it on and very quickly evaluate whether your voltage is appropriate. Um, and I'll show that later, and that's what I would recommend in that instance. Um, but in any case, so that's the basic, um, basic voltage divider and explanation of how these mods work on a kind of an electrical level. And it's also worth noting that this um, R1 and R2, they aren't necessarily like a single resistor. That's just kind of a like, representation of how it works. In reality, this is probably like a bunch of circuitry and resistors, and this is a bunch of different resistors in some cases. But, you know, we simulate them as R1 and R2 because effectively that's how the voltage divider works. But anyways, um, so we'll go up now and um, take a look at the GPU and probe some resistances and actually like solder some volt mods on there and, and you'll see um, kind of how it works. In, in, in implementation. So let's get to that. All right, so the first step, of course, is going to be to disassemble the GPU because we need to have access to the PCB in order to do any of our mods and our probing, etc. So we're just going to be disassembling this real quick. I'll just show it as a time lapse. So here's our GTX 280 disassembled. You might have noticed that wasn't the most fun disassembly ever. Um, these things are a pain to disassemble. But anyways, so what have we got here? Here's our GPU core. Um, you can see it's got this metal on it and it's got some thermal paste still. Um, this is an integrated heat spreader like you'd get on a CPU. This generation of um, NVIDIA GPUs had an IHS. Um, I have a lot of GTX 280s actually. Here's one that's been delitted so that it doesn't have um, 
an IHS on anymore. You can see there's the bare silicon die. Um, so, but yeah, that's what you lo it looks like when you take this metal piece off. Um, anyways, I'm, I'm actually doing some testing with D-lid versus non-D-lid thermals on this one, so I'm leaving that on for now. So, to our VRM, which is the important thing. So, our V-core VRM, if you'll remember from the VRM explanation, when you're powering something that's power hungry, like a, like a GPU, um, core, what you actually need a multi-phase VRM. So what we have here is a multi-phase VRM. Um, so you can see these are our inductors right here. Usually the inductors are going to be a large and in some sort of kind of a squarish metal package. They're these kind of large things. So here's phase one, here's phase two, here's phase three, here's phase four, and here's phase five. Um, each inductor isn't always a phase, but in this case, each inductor corresponds to an individual phase. And then this one up here, though it looks like it's the same, is actually one of our uh, GPU voltage rails. I mean, our memory voltage rails, if I remember correctly. But anyways, it's different. This isn't part of. The main five phases are right here. And so this side of the inductor is going to be the output, um, the output voltage of the inductor. And then... Um, these things right here, these little black squares that are covered in the white uh, thermal pad um, residue right here, 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 and here are power stages which combine a bunch of the functionality including the switch. So they um, switch the voltage, the 12 volts to the inductor on and off as we discussed. And then our voltage controller is right here. So... Um, yeah, so this is our voltage controller, and the feedback pin is actually down on this corner. Um, so determining the feedback pin can be done in a few ways. You can just probe stuff, you can kind of experiment, but that can be a real pain, especially if there's like 50 pins. You can find a data sheet, so if you read the um, code on top of this voltage controller, the product, uh, the, like the number that corresponds to the model of the voltage controller, sometimes if you Google that, you can find a PDF data sheet on the internet. Um, I'll actually show you one of the voltage controllers on this card that does have a data sheet later so we can read that But this one actually doesn't this Volterra voltage controller does not have a data sheet um, Luckily also the GTX 280 is a very popular card to mod if you just search on the internet You know GTX 280 voltage mods and spend some time looking at forums That's how I've gotten most of the information to do the mods on this card is just from forum posts other people who've already done the mods and figured out um, where everything is so that's very helpful and that will be the case for many very popular video cards. So, for example, Buildzoid has a series on the Pascal cards that you can look at that shows you what pins you need to get, etc. Um, anyways, so why don't we start with the core mod, which is, which is the one that, you know, most people are going to want. And, um, yeah, we'll take a look at that uh, core mod and flip the GPU over because the point we're going to be soldering to is actually on the back of the card. So... I know, um, based on the forum posts that I looked at, but also you can kind of just tell by looking at the PCB in some cases, that this pa little pad right here, I don't even know if you can hear, let me get at a different angle. This pad right here that I'm pointing to with the needle point on DMM probe corresponds to the feedback pin. So, sometimes if the voltage controller is a large one, like for memory, they're often kind of large, you can solder to the feedback pin directly. For a little voltage controller, like the core ones usually are, because they need a lot more pins so the pads are much smaller, um, it's really difficult to solder to the pin itself. If you're starting out, it's probably not feasible. The best thing you can do is look at the traces. So you can see all these little PCB traces um, you know, just by looking at the board. Um, the best thing to do usually, if you've figured out which pin the feedback pin is, is look at the traces and see what's the nearest thing connected to the feedback pin. Or sometimes they'll go to the back through a via, and then you can solder onto the back. Um, in this instance, so we know that that's the pin. In, in other instances, you don't necessarily know, and I'll show, you know, um, I'll show some footage, I actually have footage of me modding another video card that might be better for understanding how you would typically figure out what you want to solder to. Of course, in this case, since I'm just going off of information that other people have provided to me, which you can often do, 
especially if you make sure um, that you're starting out modding on video cards that already people have written on. Um, I'm just going to do that pin. So let's do a little bit of measurement to show um, our resistances so that you can see what we were talking about earlier. So I'm going to zoom out here and turn on my multimeter to resistance mode. Let's see. Okay, I don't know if you can see that very well, but um, we're going to probe some resistances. So first off, it's kind of difficult because these are really small pads, but I've determined that this little pad um, right here corresponds to the core voltage output. And the way I've determined that is not super difficult, actually. It's pretty easy to do. If you just look at the other side of the card, you can see the output side of this inductor. Um, you can see that that's kind of on the same plane of the PCB as it's on this plane right here. So this like big power plane, I don't know if you can see maybe with that light, if you I move it around, you can kind of see this big power plane right here corresponds to the output side of the inductor. So that's how I can tell that this little pad right here that's exposed, I don't really know what this pad's for, but that's how I can tell that this little pad right here is connected to the core. Of course, um, if you need to, you can always just probe the output side of the inductor. That's like the safe, you always kind of know that that's the positive, unless the inductor is configured backwards, which doesn't usually happen. So like, it would be kind of painful, but you could always just probe the output side of the inductor right here and reach around and kind of touch stuff. But since I figured out that this um, right here corresponds to the, volt, to the, um, to the output of the VRM, the output power plane, I'm just gonna, going to probe that like that. And then we're going to um, touch this to the feedback pin. Oh, whoops, I have this on continuity, so it's going to beep. And look at what we get on our multimeter readout. 1.6 ohms, 1.5 ohms. So that's what I said it was when we were doing the calculation earlier. Whoops. Uh, I said it was 1.5 ohms between the output of the GPU, uh, of the VRM, and the feedback pin. And um, it's hard to get this. And you can see that's about right. So that was a measurement I actually got from, from probing the GPU. So it's about 1.5 ohms. And next, let's do a measurement to ground. That one's, of course, much easier. There's a lot of ground points on any GPU. Some of the PCI pins are ground, and you can easily determine which ones that is by just, um, by just searching up the like pinout diagram for, for PCIe 8 pin power or whatever. Um, the, another safe point that's always ground is the shroud. So that's the easy one. You can just touch your multimeter to the metal on the shroud, like around the DVI port or around, you know, just the shroud itself. Or also these, um, these screw holes. The metal around these screw holes is also ground. So that's what I'm going to use in this case. So we've got that touching to the ground right here. And let's touch this to our, our uh, thing. I'm doing this with my left hand, so it's a little difficult. Let's switch hands. So I'm doing this one with my right hand. That'll be easier. And you can see that we've got two right now. It'll probably drop. So I said it was 1.8. And yeah, it's 1.9-ish. Anyways, pretty close. So, so that's what you can see. So between our feedback and our um, and our the output of our VRM is 1.5 ohms, and between our uh, ground and the feedback is 1.9. And those would correspond, of course, to our R1 and R2 that we looked at on the resistance calculator. Um, yeah. So, so that's kind of showing you how you would put the, that you know theory of the of the voltage divider into practice, measuring it on the card. Um, but in the end, what we need to do is very simple. Like we discussed earlier, it, it is simply soldering a variable resistor in between ground and the positive of our feedback pin. 
Of course, so here is what a variable resistor or a potentiometer looks like. So a potentiometer has three leads. The middle lead of the potentiometer is always going to be the wiper. And basically to turn a potentiometer into a variable resistor, what you want to do is just only use two of the leads. So one of our leads, um, we are just going to kind of put off to the side here, kind of fold it out of the way. I usually just fold it kind of up and around like that. And um, then these two leads are going to be the ones that we actually use for our mod. And we've created a variable resistor where when we, when we um, turn this little screw um, adjustment thing right here, <clears throat> the resistance between these two legs is going to change. And so another thing that we want to do when we wire up the mod is to... Um, is to use a switch. Why do we want to use a switch? There's a number of reasons. First of all, you probably want to be able to turn the mod off. For example, let's say you're modding so that you can do benchmarks on dry ice or something. And on dry ice, you have the core up to 1.5 volts or something. Well, what if you decide to run the card not on dry ice later on in the day or whatever? You probably don't want 1.5 volts. And you probably also don't want to have to be spinning that little adjustment thing all the way back down to the voltage you want. It's much easier to just include a switch and simply flip the switch on and off and you can easily turn off your mod in t you know, whenever you want. Another great practical reason I include the switch is because if you realize that your mod doesn't work and your voltage is way too high, it's really easy to just flip that switch off really fast. Sure, you can turn off your power supply, but my power supply has really big capacitors and actually holds a charge for about you know, a few seconds on its own before it'll even shut off once you hit the switch. So, for safety purposes, I really like having the switch um, on the volt mod so that you can turn it on and off, and if you notice any issues with your mod, you can easily just flip it off and, and you'll be fine. But the main reason is the convenience. You just, you, you don't want your mods on all the time usually, because they, they give you a really high voltage. What you want is to be able to flip them on and off depending on what you're doing. So that is why we will also include a little switch, which I have here. The easiest thing to do is to just use a kind of um, flip, just, a, just like a two position, you know, on off toggle switch. Um, I had some nice ones from Mauser earlier, but they were kind of expensive and I ran out. So now I'm just gonna use um, a cheap one like this. They're a little big, they're actually way too big. But um, anyways, they do, they actually switch between, so these two being connected versus these two being connected. But of course, we don't need uh, three. We don't need three. We only need two. So we'll just have on and off um, as our switch positions. So, anyways, what we're going to do is basically solder this in, you know, a simple switch configuration. So we are going to connect um, a wire coming from that from that little pad to our switch then from our switch to our potentiometer, then from our potentiometer to the ground. And of course, it doesn't really matter what order where you put the switch uh, versus the, the potentiometer, or whatever, as long as the switch just, um, you know, turns on and off the connection between the potentiometer and the feedback or the potentiometer and ground, it's going to do what you want it to do. All right, so the first step is always going to be soldering a wire to your pad um, the pad that corresponds or whatever connection point um, corresponds to the feedback pin. This is typically the hardest part of the volt mod because these pads tend to be really small, especially for the core voltage. And I mean, it's just small surface mount soldering. Um, there's a bit of a learning curve. I definitely recommend, first of all, I never really included a disclaimer in this video, like, you know, try at your own risk, whatever. Obviously, it's very easy to break a card doing this, especially if you're not fully comfortable. Um, always make sure that your mods only do what you intended. If you accidentally shorted something, put a wire where it shouldn't be, um, you know, you soldered two pads together on accident because you used too much solder or whatever, you can easily break your card. You can cause it to do output a really high voltage that instantly fries everything. If it's your first time, don't practice on like, your, you know, 3090 or something. Um, most people get started with really cheap shitty cards. These GT2, GTX 280s are like $30 on eBay. 
Um, yeah, of course, the usual disclaimers, it's soldering, it's electronics, you can easily break things. Um, most people who volt mod it probably have stories of breaking things, for sure. Um, it's pretty common, you know, it's kind of unavoidable in some cases, or you just, volt mods are fun and you put too much voltage and you blow stuff up. Anyways, um, without further ado, let's start actually modding. So yeah, so this is the pad we want right here, oh, right there. And um, this is a new soldering iron tip. I usually use like a different one, but we're going to try this one out. I think it might work pretty well. Um, it's actually a lot harder to do this on camera because I have to like work around the tripod. But my usual approach is to get the iron hot, get the wire right over the pad, use the iron to sandwich the wire down onto the pad, and then just add some solder. So you'll see me doing that here. Um, there's many, many people have different like schools of thought on how you should do this. Um, there's n I don't think there's necessarily a right or wrong way. As long as you get a good connection, it doesn't really matter what you do. Oh, I think we actually did get, um, get pretty good contact right there, but it's not great because you don't have very much solder on there and it didn't really have any flux when we got on there so I think that's a pretty weak connection. So what I'm going to do is just add a little more solder now that it's kind of pinned on there. All right so usually the test that you can do is just kind of move it around and if it moves around without like breaking off it's usually good enough. Keep in mind that we're not really like putting any current through these connections or anything. They're purely just to make electrical connections so that you can modify the resistance. There's no like real current flowing through there. So it's not a huge deal if your connection's not like, you know, great. It's, it's, it, the, the standards are pretty low. And then one thing you can do, um, which I will do later, is apply some like hot glue over that. First of all, that prevents like the metal part that we have exposed from touching anything else and shorting. And then it also kind of just immobilizes the whole connection so that when you move this wire around, you're not like, um, you know, when you move the wire around, you're not actually stressing the connection, but instead it's kind of immobilized there and with the hot glue. So well, I'm actually gonna grab my hot glue gun and do that right now. All right, so now we need to wire up our switch and our potentiometer. All right, so that's a pretty good joint. The next thing we're going to do is um, bend the leg of our pot so that it kind of goes around the other side of our switch.
now, so the mod is complete. You can see we soldered it such that um, our variable resistor with two leads is connected one side to the switch and one side to ground, and then the switch is connected one side to the potentiometer and one side to the um, pad of the feedback. And so that'll give us the ability to toggle in and out um, our, our uh, variable resistor. So I'm going to just uh, hot glue this um, in place. Of course, we haven't tested it yet, but hot glue isn't really permanent or anything. You can kind of just rip it off. So I'd rather just have it be secured and hot glued before we go on to do any testing or anything like that. All right, so one thing, um, one thing I want to do before we go any further, and I always make sure to do this right after installing each mod, is to set our variable resistor for maximum resistance. Um, as we discussed earlier in the, in the voltage divider, you know, kind of explanation, adding the parallel resistor, having it be too much resistance is never an issue. You'll just kind of reduce it. Um, or if, if the resistor is way too large in value, you won't get any useful adjustment until the very end of the adjustment range which is, um, you know, not good and that'll be a problem and you'll have to use a smaller one, but it'll never damage the card. So what I want to do to make sure that we don't damage anything and to make sure that, you know, we start out with the most resistance we have on our pot is to just adjust this, oh, wrong direction, is to adjust this for maximum resistance. Um, and I do that by just, I have um, my multimeter leads, you can see here with mini grabbers attached to each leg of the um, of the variable resistor with the switch turned off and I'm just turning it such that the voltage increases and I'll take it to close to the maximum if not the maximum voltage of the um, resistance of this pot which is 100 ohms. All right 84 should be pretty good I think actually a 50 ohm pot would have worked fine here but we chose 100. Um, anyways I think 85 Ohm should be perfectly good. If we boot this up, we know it'll be safe. And then, of course, we can see that if we turn this on, we get our um, other resistance, our resistance through the entire circuit rather than just through the uh, pot that we have. All right, so now that our mod is wired up, I'm going to wire a seven segment LED voltage display. I really like these displays. They're super helpful. They're pretty much standard for uh, volt mods. Most people use them. Um, they basically allow you to see your voltages without having to have a multimeter set up with probes. It's really nice if you want to just, you know, be able to adjust all your voltages on the fly, not have to switch multimeter leads and connections out or whatever. Um, they're super convenient and they also look pretty cool and they're cheap on Amazon. So they have these little things on the side. I just cut them off with the wire cutter. They kind of fly in a random place. I don't know where that went. And then, so the way these work is they need, um, they have a sense line, They have, which is this uh, white one. Then they have a positive, the red one, which goes to... Um, a voltage that actually drives the circuitry in this thing. Um, in our case, the voltage that it's sensing isn't enough to drive it, so it needs a separate drive voltage um, for power supply, which we are going to wire to a 12 volt pin on our um, on our uh, PCIe power um, connector, and then we are going to wire the black pin to ground. So I find that soldering directly to the 12 volt and ground points on the PCIe, um, on the 8 pin and the 6 pin power, soldering directly to these pins can be a huge pain because they have a lot of lead free solder on them and they soak up a lot of heat so it's really difficult to get them flowing. What I've done is just added two big pieces of solid core wire, one to this one to the ground and this one to the 12 volt. Um, so now that I can solder my seven segment displays and my ground for some of the volt mods to this point and this point rather than having to like try and get them to flow onto these pins. So that's the nice thing about modding. You can always kind of do little things to make it easier for yourself. Um, obviously stuff like this makes it look a little bit uglier, but I find it's, it really improves the usability so, um, and the ease of soldering. So I've just gone in and added those and now let's wire up our display.
All right, now I wanna hook up our sense voltage. So we've got the positive and minus negative up. Power supply leads hooked up for our seven segment display. Now we need to figure out where we're going to get, we're going to sense our core voltage from. And the thing about this is that you can always put it on the output side of the inductors in your VRM. As I said earlier, that's always a safe spot. You're always gonna get the right voltage from there. But it's better if you, um, it's better if you get it right from right behind the die because it'll be much, it'll be a more accurate reading that way. So there's a bunch of capacitors and stuff behind the die and there is a way you can kind of figure out which side of these capacitors is ground and which isn't. And in this case, weirdly enough, we also have these two random pins right here or pads that have nothing on them. You can see that maybe that's a spot for a cap or something. Maybe, I mean, I'm not actually sure what those are for, but in any case, you can see them right here. They're the circular ones. We've got one right there and another right there. And those look like very attractive places to hook up our die sense. And so now I want to, our current, our voltage sense rather. And so now I'm going to figure out which one is good and which one is not. So let's zoom out a bit. And I have a hunch that one of these is core is um, ground and one of them is our positive um, co core voltage. So I have one lead hooked to ground and the other is this one. And so if we probe the left pad here, we can see it gives about 0 0.3, 0 0.2 ohms. Let's see, let's see if we can get a better read on that. Um, because I want what I want to show is that this one which should go down to 0.1 ohms yeah this one is basically at ground that's probably the resistance of my leads so the left pad is at ground and the right pad is at 0 0.7 0 0.6 ohms maybe it'll go down to 0.5 but in any case that's not quite at ground and if we probe the pat the little uh, pad over here which we earlier determined was the output connected to the output of our VRM, we can see that this pad is also about 0.5 ohms. So my hunch is that the right hand one of these two little uh, circular pads right here, the one on the right hand that's connected to our, um, our positive V core. So that's what I'm going to hook our sense up to. And by hooking it up right there, we'll get a more accurate reading so when we adjust our voltage based on our seven segment LED display, we'll be getting a more accurate indication of what's actually going into the core, which is a good thing. But the downside is that soldering um, to right behind the core like this is, is a bit risky. I mean, if you bridge one of those caps and you short them out, um, that can be really difficult to fix. So I'm gonna be very careful um, in connecting this right here. All right, so that looks pretty good to me. I think we got it. Um, I was able to just use the solder that's already kind of on, was on that pad and just kind of hold it down that way. So that's very convenient. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely on there. It looks pretty good. And of course, the most important thing here is that it's not shorting anything else. So you can see here that it appears to be pretty good. I don't think we shorted anything out there especially this angle you can see. Um, I don't think anything's shorted there. I'm also gonna look at it under the magnifier, but um, I think we're good, I think we're clear. So the next thing, I definitely wanna get some hot glue on that one to kinda hold it down and prevent the little exposed bit of wire at the end from coming in contact with anything. All right, so I've uh, just plugged the card into a throwaway kinda test bench motherboard I use when I think something might blow up and um, Yep, so we're just going to turn it on and verify that our volt mod works and our, um, and our seven segment display is hooked up correctly. Um, yep, I usually do this after each mod just so that you don't do a bunch of them and then something goes wrong and you're not really sure what happened. I find it's nice to um, just check them as you go. Uh, it's pretty simple too. So 
reach around, turn our power supply on, and just gotta short this out, I don't have a real power button. And I don't have the fan plugged in because we're just running it for a few seconds to verify it works. So this is 1.18 volts. That's what it runs at stock. Um, so that's good. Our seven segment is displaying properly. Let's try flipping our switch. And you can see we're up to 1.21 slash 1.20. It's kind of bouncing around. Maybe if I adjust it a little bit. We'll be not on the border. Now, still, okay, now we're up to 1.21 more solidly. All right, so you can see there we've got 1.21, and we flip the switch. Whoa, it's about to fall off. All right, I don't want that to short anything out if it falls, the seven segment. It's kind of loose. I had to unglue it because the shroud conflicts. But anyways, you can see that our volt mod clearly works. Um, flip it once more for good measure. There you go. So, yep. Um, and as you can see also, it's worth noting that um, I, it's, it's only on about 70 ohms of resistance right now, and still we're getting, um, we're getting like 30 millivolts of difference. That's more than you would predict just using the, um, the voltage divider calculator based on the resistances we measured. I'm pretty sure that you wouldn't predict this much of a change. So that's kind of a cautionary, um, a cautionary tale of don't always trust the resistances you get when you probe the board to be like, you know, exact. Give, give a lot of margin of error. I like to often make the, um, make the, the pot that you add be at least um, 50 times the value. So here that would give us about 100. So I think that was a good amount. You can see that um, we get at m the minimum voltage increase we get is about probably about 20 millivolts and we can go all the way up to you know as many volts as we'd ever want so I think this is a great configuration for our core volt mod and let's get on to the others all right so I think I'm just going to show um, one more rail in the video I'm actually modding f uh, four rails total on this card but the video is already going to be quite long so I think just doing one more um, should be enough and the reason, so I'm going to do the PLL rail now. Um, not a super important rail for ambient, but, you know, we're going to do it anyways, um, just in case it does something on sub-zero, because I'm going to be putting this card on dry ice. So the PLL rail circuitry is all kind of right around in here. And one of the reasons I chose to do this rail on the video, as opposed to the memory rails, is that this, um, this voltage control right here for this rail does have a data sheet. So I want to sh just sh quickly show um, when you can find... Oh, oops, my multimeter. Um, just, I wanted to quickly show when you can find a data sheet, how to figure out which pin is feedback from the data sheet. So you can't see it on the camera, I don't think, but if you look at the uh, top of this chip using, you know, good human eyesight, you can see that the c there's a um, code on top of the chip, RT9259. So if you Google RT9259, you will get a, get a data sheet, which I will put up on the screen right now. And looking at the data sheet, if you scroll down to, um, to where the pinout is, you can see one of the pins is labeled FB. And that's FB for feedback. Um, so basically, uh, there you go. That's the feedback pin. So, um, so it says it is pin four, and you can orient yourself using the um, the little dot on the top left, which is represented on the pinout, and it's also show. You can see it on the um, on the voltage controller itself. Let me bring the um, magnifying glass over and zoom in a bit. Maybe that'll help. Um, yeah, so you can see there's this little dot. There's this little dot right here. And if you look on the data sheet, you can see that pin four is just four down from that dot on that side. So you can go one, two, 
three, and four. So that's our pin right there. And then let's zoom out a bit. Oop, wrong way. Zoom out a bit. And so I'm gonna put my other probe here on ground or just on the shield of our, um, our IO shield right here. And so now we're probing the resistance of the feedback pin. And you can see it is 0.681 kilo ohms, which is of course 681 ohms. And then we'll just round that to 680. Um, so yep, 680 ohms is our, is our resistance to ground. And then just to be sure and diligent and see that there is in fact a voltage divider here, we can probe the resistance between um, our feedback pin and the output of our VRM. And I'm pretty sure that this inductor corresponds to the PLL rail. So probe that inductor and probe our feedback pin. One, two, three, four. And you can see that we have, uh, well, you can't see that well. Uh, yeah, there's nothing I can do about that. But anyways, there's a lot of glare, but you can see that we have um, 0.671 kilo ohms or 671 ohms. So yes, there does a, indeed appear to be a voltage divider here. There's a similar-ish um, resistance both directions for um, what would be R1 and R2 in our, you know, in our little diagram that we looked at earlier of a voltage divider. So yep, that does look good. And I think we should be able to just do a standard feedback mod there. Um, so because the PLL voltage, my, I, I have, from reading the forums, I've gathered that the PLL voltage should not be increased very much. You can maybe give it an extra like 50 millivolts or something, but you're really not supposed to like crank the PLL voltage very high. So what I'm going to do is be very conservative. And for our 700 ish ohm, um, resistance, I'm going to use a 50 kilo ohm um, a 50 kilo ohm uh, potentiometer or variable resistor. So yeah, so we're gonna use a 500, um, 50 kilo ohm VR and then of course we're going to solder. And because you can see um, on this voltage controller, our pins are pretty large. So I'm gonna show just soldering directly to the pin. Um, let me get the light better situated. So yeah, I'm gonna just solder directly to that pin this time, um, which I think should be easy enough. It's a pretty large pin. And then we will configure the volt mod and then we will configure our seven segment display just like last time. All right, so I actually um, soldered that on and forgot to hit record. So we're gonna desolder it and just do it again. It wasn't my best work anyways. Okay, so definitely wanna make sure that the wire end of the wire is very short the exposed part because you don't want to short anything out um, and this time I think we're going to be able to easily just kind of I already got some solder on there from last time shouldn't be too difficult to just yeah. All right, I think that's decent. Yeah, that's definitely good enough. I had it on better the first time, but you know, forgot to hit record, but what do you do? All right, so there we go. Um, you can see, I'll try to get a better view there. So yep, you can see that it's a, not quite on center, but we're not actually touching the other pin. Um, at least I don't think we are. No, we're definitely not touching the other pin. Um, get a better view. Yeah, this view you can see. Um, it's a little off center, but it's not actually making contact with any of the other pins. Um, so, yep, just solder directly onto the pins when they're big like that and it works pretty well. Um, just, yeah, and once you're done, make sure you didn't bridge anything, but we're definitely good here. Um, 
and it, it's pretty strong joint, strong enough for our purposes. So I'm just gonna route the the um, wire actually like I'm gonna put that pot on the all the way on the other end of the board. So just gonna route the wire through a screw hole like so. And then So I don't really know where to find the output of the PLL except for at the output inductor. So I'm just going to solder right to the um, output side of our inductor here. And I know this is the output side. Well, we probed it earlier, but also because this power plane runs to this uh, capacitor right here. And this is the positive side of the capacitor. So that, that tells me that this is the output here of our um, of our of our VRM or of our little butt converter because this um, this is just a decoupling capacitor. All right, so we're basically done with the second mod. I just want to, again, before we turn anything on, set our pot to basically the maximum value or at least to 40k um, so that we don't get shocked with a high PLL voltage which could be very bad. This pot is a really high value we might not have much adjust range so um, if the pot's not really doing much I might end up replacing it with one with a slightly lower, um, slightly lower resistance, but I won't show that on the video because it's getting late and I'm gonna wrap this up soon. All right, so moment of truth for our PLL mod. Let's see what happens. Um, I I'm not even sure what the voltage is supposed to be. I read on a forum it was supposed to be like 1.5 or something, but that I don't even know if that was for this video card or whatever. Honestly, no idea, so. Um, I guess we'll find out. So, all right, it looks like we're getting 1.2 volts, 1.1, 1.2. And um, let's flip our mod on. All right, so that definitely did change it. It brought us up to 1.22. So the mod's only giving us 15, 10, 15 millivolts, it looks like, or maybe almost 20, I guess, which is, um, yeah, it's probably, no, it's giving us like 10, 10-ish, because we're on the borderline between 120 and 121, so, yep, it adds, um, that's a good amount, and I'm, I'm glad, again, that I went with a relatively high value, um, value for our trimmer, because I like, you know, I like that the Volt mod starts out at 1.22, because I think PLL is something that you don't need to increase much. It might only be 1.25, for example, that gives any benefit. Um, but anyways, yep, so you can see here, both our mods are clearly working. They're both off now, and then we can switch them both on. All right, so I think that's going to be it for our um, little bit of an intro to volt modding. Give you one last look at the card here. We didn't really get a good overall view earlier. Um, yep, it's pretty ugly on the back. I usually put a lot of effort into making everything look nice, but uh, filming was quite distracting, so that didn't happen in the end. But um, yep, I'm gonna add two more, um, two more volt mods for both the memory rails, but I'm just gonna do that, you know, do that without filming. And um, yeah, but I hope, that was, uh, I hope that was informative. I hope it was interesting or you learned something. Um, if you have any feedback or notice any errors or anything, please let me know. Um, I'm not an expert, like I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm not, you know, not one of the hardcore guys who's done hundreds of mods or anything like that. But um, I did think that there wasn't that much content on volt modding or modding in general on YouTube. And I thought it would be kind of cool to just show my process. And, you know, yeah. So I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any feedback, please leave it. And thanks for watching.